Here are just a couple of statements that I'd like you to become familiar with. First of all, in ancient times, painting and statues, they weren't what we regard them. They weren't just art. They were objects that had a definite purpose. Something more than being hung on a museum wall and being admired later. Many times they worked magic. Another statement that is interesting for you to understand is that primitive, when we talk about primitive art, we don't mean that in a condescending sense, that it's something that we could do much better, these primitive peoples just didn't know as much as us. What it means is that they're closer to a state from which all mankind emerged. We all have our origins in something much more primitive. And in that sense, at this this, this this term primitive just distinguishes one category of artworks from another. Here's some very early artwork from Altamira, Spain. 15,000 BC. That's 17,000 years ago. These drawings were made on cave walls deep underground. In Spain and France we find these and they're pictures of animals. The interesting thing about this is that for being very primitive, primitive in the sense of being old, these things have a lot of grace and style to them and coloring. For example, take a look at this this backside here of an animal. There's nothing very crude about the way that that that's depicted. It's got rather a lot of shape to it. And think about this now. This was being drawn by somebody using whatever earth materials they could find here to darken the walls, using uh, for light only some smoking torch in a rather creepy place a couple of hundred feet underground, and this animal was not present. This person was drawing this from their memory. Here's a, another animal that has a rather interesting shaped hump on it here. The, and many times the people who made these drawings actually use the irregular features of the cave to make uh, outcroppings be parts of the body so they had a 3D sort of an element to them. Here's another illustration. In this case a reddish kind of a pigment was being used here so my arrow and my circle won't work, work too well. I think I'm going to change this pen color to something like, oh let's say black here so I can do this better. In this area here, that red pigment is some sort of earth that probably has iron in it and it's rusted to a red. That's one of the few ways uh, primitive peoples had of creating that sort of a color for pigment. And here we have another rather curving shape. Here, a very fine example of a horse with interesting shape to the legs here, rather graceful, large body. And you can see the selective use of the coloring here to give also a sense of the shape of the belly here, a round belly. The person who drew this had something in mind in representing this horse. It may have been that they wished to control, have some control over this animal by picturing it here and showing it in a way that it was being hunted and it was successfully being hunted so that it might be a precursor to some future event. Or it might be that they had already hunted an animal like this, or they greatly respected the animal, and they had some concept that the animals had a presence and an existence after even its death, so that maybe this animal stood for other animals of this type. And in paying homage or respect to this one, the other ones would in some ways either come under the control of these individuals or would regard them as highly because they might have been, they might have been honoring some, some uh, archetype here of that type of animal. We really don't know because these peoples didn't leave any written language behind any kind of explanations of this. What they did leave behind, however, was a little bit of evidence of themselves. In many cases, things like this exist in the cave walls where somebody has put their hand here and then probably taken some pigments in their mouth and spit it out in a splattering sort of a way using their hand as a template. And it's interesting to take your own hand and compare it to this. Your hand is shaped in a very similar way to this. Probably your hand is larger 
people may not have been as large in the past because nutrition isn't what it was today. This might be thousands and thousands of years old. Of course, the person whose hand this is the shape of has long since ago, uh, long since uh, past died and turned back into dust. <music> But here we see a little bit of a ghostly reminder of what they were when they were alive. We're going to be talking about the technology of art in this class. And in ancient times, the technology included pigments that were natural earth. And by that we mean they're found elements. They're things that exist in the ground, different colors of earth, things that occur naturally. And they're pretty much limited to the range of colors that you see here. This sort of ochre, which is a yellow. Uh, sort of going off to an, an orange, maybe with more iron and rust. It turns out looking like more reddish. Uh, here's some natural blacks. In many cases, these were formed by something having been burnt. Here, the name burnt umber doesn't necessarily mean that it was burnt. It's some very darker color of earth. And here we might have found some, some elements that had been ground up, like a, a lightish color rock or a slate to make a pigment of this color. Green was a very tough color, although there's green all around us. It's green from chlorophyll, which once a plant dies, it turns into other chemical compounds. So a greenish element like this, greenish colors were hard to find naturally occurring. Here's something important about the use of these natural colorings. Of course, this is taken from a website of a vendor that still processes these and makes them up for people who want to work with some of the original types of materials. And this was a link active at least some time ago for a vendor that does that. The important thing about these was, aside from having burned certain things to create blacks, we don't really think the ancients did much to manipulate these compounds and create newer compounds from them with perhaps newer colors. They used the materials as they found them. Here's just another way to illustrate some of these colors all the way from some sort of a red to a goldish or a yellow. And perhaps this being called green, but it looks more like a turquoise blue to us. So perhaps in Italy, these types of compounds would have been found and were much more common. And you see here an example of how in the American Southwest, this sort of a reddish color uh, exists with a lot of iron compounds in rocks. And the, the, the crumbling rocks here might be ground up to make a color such as this. And here's just another example of a vendor that still sells these kinds of things. And you would notice they all have a rather subdued quality to them. There's nothing very bright, this perhaps being one of the brightest. And it isn't terribly bright by modern standards. So characteristics of naturally occurring pigments, naturally occurring pigment materials. They were used directly, that is, without any heating or chemical manipulation. And as a matter of fact, let's change this pointer color now to uh, something that might show up better, a little red. Binder is a very important term. If we're talking about paint, let's establish some terms here. The pigment is the powder. Maybe you get it from natural earth or you get it from grinding up various kinds of stones and it becomes a powder. The binder is some liquid that's used to mix with the pigment and form paint. So you see pigment plus binder equals paint. Sort of running down in this direction here. The earliest uh, and uh, most common binder in early times was water or some other bodily fluid. You can take your pick, and I won't suggest which. A liquid like that will mix with some substance as well, and not well with others. It also, unless the substance itself has some natural adhesive quality, the binder of this type isn't necessarily going to help stick that paint to walls. So the cave drawings that you saw earlier probably were made by people rubbing the materials themselves onto the wall, perhaps without any binder at all or egg yolks might have been used as a binder. And that became common uh, in the time of the uh, Romans and later uh, into the Middle Ages. In the Renaissance, oil was tried out as a binder, and that's still very common. And these days, as a binder in modern latex paints, we've reverted back to water by some chemical manipulation of the compounds. We've developed compounds that mix well with water. So these days, some types of paint, especially inside house paint, is typically not oil-based, but it's latex, which means water is the binder. Mm -hmm.
And that concludes what we'll talk about in Chapter 1.